once again. Uh, I'm going to continue talking here about some of these environmental issues. So we talked previously about uh, invasive species, uh, species extinction as well. Another important environmental issue is water pollution. So water pollution is basically, so pollution in general is just adding some uh, harmful substance that's, that can in, da, endanger organisms to the water, to the air, to the soil. So water pollution is adding harmful substances to the water. And there's lots of different types of um, things that humans sometimes pollute water with. And one of those is sewage. So just raw sewage, the stuff that goes down your drains and, and toilets is sewage. And if that material gets into the water, um, it can be harmful in a couple different ways. Um, it can spread disease, but also it acts as a fertilizer. So any like fertilizer that you might use on your lawn, for example, or that they might use in agriculture, those fertilizers, when they're sprayed on their field, if they wash into the water, what they do is they add a large amount of nutrients and algae can grow very quickly. And then um, when they die and decompose, they use up all of the oxygen in the water. So it can create these zones where there's very little oxygen for organisms to live. Also things like pesticides, which kill insects and kill, um, kill weeds and things like that. Those substances can get into the water and not only will they kill insects or weeds, but they can kill natural vegetation and animals that are in the water as well. There's even a type of pollution called thermal pollution when it's not actually adding a substance, but heating up the water um, can cause problems because as the temperature of water increases, the amount of oxygen it can hold decreases. So if you take in water, for example, at a nuclear power plant, and then release hot water back into the lake, that hot water holds less oxygen and that could impact the organisms that live there. And just like those pesticides we talked about with the endangered species get into the food web, the same thing happened in the water. If you add these dangerous substances to the water, they make their way through the food chain, building up in the tissues of organisms until it becomes toxic. And the types of things that can be dangerous, things like heavy metals like mercury or lead or arsenic. Um, PCBs are a type of pollutant that's in, um, in electrical equipment and used in industry. DDT is a pesticide. Um, also like plastics, you probably heard of microplastics um, that are put into the water, can get into the... Um, digestive system of different animals. Also, all of that can be harmful. And um, some possible ways of helping with this problem, um, to dispose of waste properly is the biggest one, right? So if there's you know, waste from a manufacturing facility, rather than just discharging it into the water, it can be contained and disposed of in a way that doesn't get into the environment. Or if wastewater um, can be treated before it gets released. Like that's what actually happens if things are working properly to sewage from your house. Anything that goes down a sink or toilet in your house makes its way to a wastewater treatment plant down in Utica, which is um, it's near Babes and Taco Bell and Dunkin' Donuts uh, over in that area of like North Utica. And there's a water treatment facility there which takes in the water that comes from all of our sewers and basically treats it with bacteria and other ways of filtering out those harmful substances. And once it's completely treated, that clean water can be released. It gets released into, I think, the Mohawk River. And it's been treated, however, and it's safe. And also the less pesticides we use, the less fertilizer, the less likely they're going to be to pollute our water. You know, and so an interesting example of this in a way of reducing the use of pesticides is to use an alternative that's called biocontrol. 
biocontrol is using one organism to try to control another organism. I told you about that activity I used to do in my class where we raise these insects, these beetles, and release them in the Utica marsh in hopes that they would destroy the loose strife plants. We were, rather than spraying pesticides to kill the loose strife, we were using another organism. That's an example of biocontrol. Um, there's a type of ant that will decapitate fire ants. And so by releasing these, these decapitating flies, I'm sorry, this type of fly into the environment, you can hope for them to control fire ants. Um, there's viruses that are sometimes used like uh, this myo myoxima virus was used to try to control the rabbit population in Brazil. Um, and it was released into the rabbit population. For insects, we could use things like, you ever seen these Japanese beetle traps? You might have them in your backyard. They use special chemicals to attract the beetles into those things. They crawl in the bag and basically can't escape. Okay, that's using something other than pesticide to try to control these Japanese beetles. Scientists have all even tried to release like sterilized male, for example, mosquitoes into the population so that they still mate with females, but they're not able to mate. And so that actually ends up reducing the population of that insect population. It's another idea. Acid rain is probably something you might have heard of or acid precipitation. Acid precipitation is caused, we, we studied acids way back early in the year when you were in school and we did that lab with the pH and the litmus paper. But so you probably know that acid is a condition of a liquid. It can be acidic or basic. And acid precipitation is when the pH of rain or snow or sleet is reduced, making it more acidic. And when that happens, it can have negative impacts on the ecosystem. So why would rain become acidic? It happens due to pollution. In cars, in factories, burning coal, um, sulfur and nitrogen can be released into the atmosphere. And what happens is they combine with water and they form sulfuric acid or nitric acid. And so when that rain falls to the earth, it's very acidic. Now, it's not like you would be out in the rain, it would be burning your skin. Sometimes people get that impression. It's, it's not that it's so acidic that it could be um, harmful or painful to our bodies, but as that acidic rain um, gets into the ecosystem, um, it starts to reduce the pH of lakes and streams and soils, and that over the long term can be damaging. Certain ecosystems are more vulnerable to acid precipitation. For example, um, spruce forests, like you might find in the Adirondacks, or soils that can't neutralize the acidic rain, they're more vulnerable. And so you have some ecosystems, you know, this is in Maine, all of these spruce trees are dying off because of acid precipitation. There are certain lakes and ponds in the Adirondacks that are completely, have no life in them because they've become so acidic over time. To help improve this condition, um, we could try to use cleaner burning fuels that don't release as much sulfur or nitrogen in the atmosphere. Okay. Um, there are ways of sort of cleaning the um, gases that are emitted from a factory before they go up into the atmosphere. Um, that's another option. And really the less fossil fuels we use, the less acid precipitation become a problem. You can even see the effects if you look at like statues or um, gravestones, if you've ever been in a cemetery, being worn away over time. Sometimes that's because of acid rain, right? Limestone is very basic and will be destroyed by acidic precipitation. You can see that in these gargoyles that were, this one was exposed to acid precipitation, this one was not. And you can see it's completely worn away the features. And if you look at this map, the orange areas are areas where acid rain has had the biggest impact. And obviously, if you look at it, 
our area is especially vulnerable to that. And one of the reasons is because of the prevailing winds in our country blow from west to east. So any pollution that's put into the upper atmosphere by power plants or factories in like the Midwest um, ends up blowing over to the east towards us and dropping that pollution on our area. So in order to try to address these problems, we need cooperation between different states. You know, it can't just be New York State limits the amount of sulfur being released. It has to be a wider range of states to actually be effective. In this diagram here shows sort of what happens as waters become more acidic. You know, so a pH of 6.5, which is not very acidic, all of these organisms can tolerate those conditions. But if the pH starts to drop due to acid precipitation, once it gets down to 5.5, this muscle no longer can survive anymore. And if we go down to 5, now the mayfly and the bass can't survive. And as we continue getting more and more acidic, we see there's fewer and fewer organisms that can tolerate those conditions. Another environmental issue you may have heard of is ozone depletion, the ozone layer. The ozone layer is a, a, a layer of um, gas very high up in the atmosphere that acts as a filter for ultraviolet radiation. So ultraviolet radiation is one form of radiation that comes from the sun. It's the form of radiation that can give us a suntan, but also can cause sunburn, or can lead increase our risk of skin cancer or eye cancer, it can be damaging to organisms. Um, so this ozone layer at the top of the atmosphere helps protect us from those rays. The problem is that there are chemicals that humans have produced called CFCs, and they destroy the ozone layer. CFCs were used frequently in um, as a propellant in sprays, like hairspray, um, or something like that. Uh, they used to be made with CFCs. They're still found in refrigerators and freezers and air conditioning units, car air conditioners. Um, and so when these CFCs get in the atmosphere, they start breaking it down. They break down the ozone layer. And that led to actually a thinning of the ozone layer and even a hole in the ozone layer over the Antarctic. And you can see that's what this purple graph represents. That's in 2006. So when this ozone layer is thinner <clears throat> or even gone in certain areas, <clears throat> more ultraviolet radiation is reaching the earth that can destroy plankton, which are the basis of the ocean food web, increase the risk of skin cancer and eye cancer for people, has a whole host of negative effects. Um, but actually, in the 1970s, there was a, an agreement amongst different countries to start limiting the use of CFCs. It's called the Montreal Protocol. And if you look at this graph, um, which shows how the hole in the ozone layer was growing over time, was getting higher and higher, but after the ban of CFCs or the reduction, what you see is it kind of stabilized that this hole's not getting bigger anymore. So that's good news. And over time, this ozone can help replenish, it can replenish over time, as long as we continue limiting our use of CFCs. So this is one example of when countries come together, when countries come to agreements and are able to limit different pollutants, they can have a positive effect on these environmental issues, but it requires cooperation between countries, it requires different groups of people to be willing to take action and limit their pollutants that they're releasing. Okay, let's, let's hold off on climate change for till tomorrow because that's a longer one. <clears throat> 